Welcome back everyone to TNO The Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, Brazil Lover, but the UDN readies for the presidential election. The UDN coalition has recently released an announcement indicating its full support for the candidacy of Governor Carlos Lacerda of Guanabara, and the result of bringing a mandate for him in the UDN. In the campaign speech of the UDN Party of Congress, Carlos Lacerda summarizes the major points of this campaign, standing up for human rights to the world over, working with closely allied powers, and bolstering the country through anti vanguardist market reforms. The UDN has shifted its campaign infrastructure to full gear in order to win the election. The cross shall make the UDN soar. Lacerda is it. But we're here having a good time as we're reading about speak at military clubs. The military clubs are probably the most important place that a soldier will attend in their career. In those places, a small group of positivists successfully convinced the other soldiers to participate in the 1889 coup, which taps the republic to this day, which stands strong. But importantly, it's also where a lot learned about the conspiracy to prevent Kubitschek from becoming president in 55. Thus, we will organize and make speeches at those clubs and rally the apathetic soldiers of the constitutionalist cause, ensuring that if the worst were to come, we have his men on the side to fight back against those who dare threaten Brazilian democracy. We could have some favoritism as a treat. Not bad, but I don't want any more nepotism, so. No favoritism, all procedure. Everything has been going according to plan. The NDC is on our side, and the speeches made by the president a lot. And the military clubs have swayed men to our side, if we keep up with what we have. And we have to ensure that the Lot Act passes into the Senate and brings a new safe era for, the Brazil, for Brazil and its democracy. Two attempts. Uh, to go anywhere beyond this would be foolish on our part. The PTB and PSD stand ready for the presidential election. In the upcoming election, the PSD PTB coalition is faced with another choice between the PSD candidate, Julesino Kubitschek, a former president, and the PTB uh, coalition, Zhao Goulart, former vice president and former chair of the Cámaras dos Deputados. The major points of Kubitschek's campaign are steady hand, economic development, and centrist focus on the implementation of Anguist, uh, or Varguist policy, contrast with the more emphasized with emphasis on, on welfare, social reform, and a more social focus on implementing Varguism. The PSD PTB coalition has resolved to unify behind one of the candidates, all of us choosing which one will favor this time around. Django. Oh, well, I mean, we are technically PSD right now. PSP, PSP. Um. Oh, man, who do we want? Left wing populist. Kubishek. That'd be kind of fun to have that guy come back. Welfare, social reform, or social focus. Economic development. I kind of want. I don't want to put him in charge. J.K. let him in charge. Oh, but they put the faith in Django. Oh, Kubishak. J.K. Uh, uh, progressivism. Lacerda. Padres is over here with conservatism. Uh, I'm not sure. 17%, 20%. Ooh, I don't really care about leading it too much, truth be told. PSD, PTB. You know what? I guess we can go with this guy. Django? Let's try Django. Why not? Hey, can you friends? On the outskirts of Brasilia, there was a renowned establishment, a best, known for its status as home uh, to one of the country's most popular officer clubs. It was a common set for the military men to sing, drink, gamble, and share stories of their experience in the armed forces, but today it was a special one for the club who was host to none other than President Henrique created Lato himself. Gentlemen, I would like to first say that it is a great honor to see you all here. It began to reside as the constitutionalists and Sorbonne officers, while hardliners and unaligned individuals were tactically uninvited. Today we should remind us of all what drives us, our love for our homeland and people, and the patriotic feeling in our hearts and nationalist fervor that causes us to go above and beyond for all Brazil. To this there was. A general murmur of agreement among those gathered, some men raising their drinks or cheering. After all, would a man without these qualities drive himself to protect all the treasures of his homeland? In this world of tyrants within politics and economics alike, we are the ones who control our oil, no one else. This time, the response was more raucous, no other leftover policy from the Vargas era could claim such universal popularity within the ranks of the military. Secondly, I would like to remind us of what our goal should be. We're not just here to fight and defend them in the name of home and people. We should all call upon to defend what makes our country worth fighting for. It's democracy and constitution that upholds it. The cheers were still there, but more muted, as most of it came from the constitutionalists within, while the Sorbonne were more restrained. Lock kept his grin up and could not help but feel but worry. The situation was worse than anything he was anticipating. Still, was determined to end this evening with more islands than he began with. Continue pressing for the defense of democracy. Go back to praising nationalism. Well, those are really, is very good. We're close to the Sorbonne, so I want to make them grow even higher than the Sorbonne. Or Sorbonne. Not Sorbonne, but Sorbonne. And a peace military. Oh, the PSB ready for elections. The PSB has recently released an announcement indicating its full support for the candidacy of Governor Ademar de Barros of Sao Paulo, and the result of bringing about another mandate for him and the PSP. In a campaign speech of the PSP Party Congress, Ademir de Barros summarized the major points of his campaign, providing welfare and uh, good governance to the people, making government more efficient and far, far better equipped, no matter the moral or economic costs, and improving the welfare of the poor. 
The PSP shifted its campaign to infrastructure, to full gear, in order to win the election. Town roll out the bribes. Despite not going with Assis of Brazil's plans and surrounding ourselves with low constitutionalists, we've achieved the loyalty of the higher, higher hierarchy by following their advice and heeding their requests of who to appoint in the high ranks of the military. As of right now, everything has been going according to their place. All should submit Lot as a great leader in their eyes, at least enough to not coup him, and ensure their utmost support for the president where he submits an act into the Senate. A new day will come to Brazil and his people will rest easy. And now the 1965 presidential election season kicks off. The presidential candidates have been picked and announced. The fierce race now begins in Brazil for who will come out on top as campaigns kick into full gear. Campaigners go door to door convincing voters one, uh, one by one on by who to vote for. Great speeches are held in front of thousands to convince the popular masses where backroom deals are held to give candidates an edge. Meanwhile, the military watches the campaign go on, their thoughts are known to the public. It's time to choose who to campaign for. Vargas Legacy, João Goulart, Carlos Acerda, Barros, Isteos Badaz. I'll go with Vargas Legacy. Presidential campaign, so Senado. So we can't do anything here. Where's the next Senate election? How do we know? So right now, João Lacerda. Oh, I guess he was a cons more of a conserv liberal conservative. Liberal. And uh, Ademar. He's a paternalist. So, presidential panel uh, displays the active presidential race, of course. Looked every five years, decided by the popular vote. Each map displays the color of the leading candidate in each region, selecting regions region each, uh, displays each candidate's popularity and allows you to choose a strategy targeting a candidate once every two weeks. Oh, once every two weeks, that's good to know. Campaigns are more effective in less populous regions. Oh. Candidates board determines the share of the region's votes. They will collect once the Brazilians head to the polls. What well, momentum affects how support rises or falls over time? Huh. What is this? 15. Will be 85% is effective due to accumulated fatigue. Fatigue accumulates as can, can, oh, as candidates campaign in the region indicates over time. So he's got momentum. Oh, so hold a rally. Oh, again, target supporters. Run negative ads. Oh, do you can decrease momentum for them too? So we could hold a rally. Increases momentum, causing support to grow over time. As long as they're strong, increases infrastructure, making future campaign decisions more effective. Huh. So how does that affect um, everything then? Like if this affects, that was my coffee, coffee cup, momentum. Does this affect momentum a lot? Because right now we're looking pretty decent. He doesn't have a lot of votes down here. He's at 41%, which is pretty good for him. 38%. Um, looking pretty good overall. But this is probably the most contested one. And we are going to go ahead and build Invest in Campaigning. Let's go with that. Oh, wow. One, two. It's growing. Slow, growing slowly. Okay. The beginning of the end. Darren has come from Paraguay. Full nuts are after their enemies in Asuncion. The Battle of Asuncion, in there, ever of course, bonds to be believed, was the cruelest and most vicious fighting ever seen on the South American soil. So brutal and hard fought was a battle that the international press branded as a Palos Berg on the Apilcomayo, obviously a reference to the horrors of the West Russian War, whatever the case, the Bolsheviks have triumphed. Our days of planning and coordination will not go in vain. The treaty that we signed with our allies of the Triple Alliance will come into effect in a matter of weeks, if not days. It's now not a matter if we will invade Paraguay, but now a question of when. Not only is our army on the highest alert, but our air force is prepared to bombard the Paraguayans with every bomb in our arsenal. The only thing we need to do is properly position our military in the border. It is of no use having our men drill for the day to come if our soldiers are not even hurt near Paraguay itself. When we're ready, the agreements will activate, including the subclass where Uruguay is allowed to march the troops through our borders for the time we are at war. And the second war, the triple lines will begin. We only need to give the order. The drumbeat to war echoes louder with every passing day. So what happens if we lower the amount of soldiers we have? Because I don't mind doing this. Because we really don't need the militia. Because then I'll delete some divisions that might be in the end. Because it's going to cost us more to do that, too, so... George Wallace! Ah, that was good! We got George Wallace in the United States of America. That was amazing. And the peace military, of course. Good. I'm just kind of hanging out here now. Go full on in. Oh, the Oriental. Oriental army, huh? Miracle, huh? Cool. Happy February, everybody. If I attack here, will I get support? Nope. Nope. Um, maybe we'll come down here instead. Maybe? I don't know.
We have no fuel, but whatever. Are the goods? Oh, there we go. Nice. Accumulated fatigue. Almost time. Um, uh, the president just put down the letter, signing, sighing, Argentina. I come call him. The troops, as he read the letter, were marching towards the border. Columns of men tanks trucks outstretching to the horizon. The letter did not spell out anything particularly shocking. Argentina, even a minuscule Uruguay, had the military ready for the invasion to begin. All they knew was Brazil. The president looked outwards towards Brasilia. The sun set behind him, bathing. Oh, crap. And the capital in brilliant hues of orange, red, pink, and uh, red. Oh, Jesus Christ, that's not good. Um... Outside, the flecks of headlights trundled home, having and flowing with the traffic, stopped and start and stopped and began once more. They understand what type of world they lived in, of course, a commoner knew about their world. They read newspapers, devoured reports, and consumed television. That was a sanitized world, the illusion that he and his ministers, along with his predecessors, had crafted like a master artisan. Where they knew it or wanted it, the president's principal job was keeping the wool over the people's eyes while advancing their interests. Why should they know? Why should they know how fragile their lives sincerely were and that a slight change in the wind, their lives could collapse into the rubble? It was almost an, an enviable in a way. Of course, Guerrero was not an idiot. Air reconnaissance picked up tens, if not hundreds, of aircraft within half required air bases. Within months, Paraguay's military had gone from a desperate yet fanatical group of college students to a highly trained unit that included a proper full fledged air force. It was impressive. It still would not be enough, though. The president took a swig from his bottle. Bitter as ashes, but that was the appeal of it, wasn't it? In seven days, the Brazilian army would assemble and just cross the Paraguayan border. In seven days, they'd blow the trumpets of war and let the Paraguayan river run red with the blood of their compatriots. In seven days, all of South America would march to war. Whatever came next, good or bad, was entirely on the shoulders. First his tragedy, then his farce. Oh, god dang it. Ready to bomb the crap out of everybody. Defeat South Africa. Grave news has come from the South African front line. The boards of the National Socialist Colonists, dudes have won, though we have prevented them from completely jousting the last flames of democracy in the tormented South African continent. Our troops are withdrawn from South African defeat, but their heads remain high. The government. Uh, and the people of the Republic of Brazil are reeling from this setback, embracing for a new wave of hostile activity in the Brazilian waters. The concern that the Lacos Commissariat will send more illegal fishers to exploit a weakened state. Accordingly, the Navy is beginning to mobilize. This matter has weakened the credibility of the sitting government, but not as badly as if there had been a total defeat. But amidst all this, there remains opportunity. Refugees and workers, good and decent people all, are at least better than subhuman Nazis, flee to Brazil in hopes of a new life, and there's always hard lessons for our systems to learn from a defeat such as this. It'll do us a power of good to learn. Jesus Christ, it's so bad for us. Why did you give up so easily? Why? Ah. It's time again for a Brazil's political parties to gear up for the election season. This year's election, a third of all Senate seats are up for election in each one in each state. The power struggle between the UDN, the coalition, the PSD, and the PDB hangs in the balance, while the PSB looks to establish itself as an electoral force. Uh, Voters around the nation will get the chance to shape our future. PSP. UDN. Well, I mean, we're trying to get Goulart in, so PTB. We're national liberals, though. Right? Yeah. Because there's no one here for us to choose. I guess Lacerda would have been the guy to choose. Continuous legacy, but whatever. Um, I guess we should go in PTB then. I probably chose him last time too. God dang it. Whatever. Uh, PTB. PSD. PSP. PTB. If I screw this all up, I'll probably redo this off screen. Too. Wow. Hey, nice. El Presidente. Second War of the Triple Alliance. Everything had been leading up to this moment. At 3 p.m., Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay will form a clear war in Paraguay. All of our troops are packed aboard with guns, planes, and tanks. In five minutes, no more, no less, the armies of the Triple Alliance will cross the border into Paraguay. Every single man knows his role, knows his task, whether it be to shoot, bomb, or drive straight into the Chia's dominion. This will be one of the deadliest wars in South American history. Well, of course, it's trained, so do Shays. It would be foolish to expect Shays' force to fight a conventional war with trenches and sweeping offenses to drive us out, no? Guerrero will use every single last weapon in his arsenal to defend himself, and we must be in war, prepared for every single eventuality that the Paraguayan army will use against us. Trained units, armed with the knowledge of disarming traps and combating guerrillas, wait for a command, however. We never give fear it is not enough. Guerrero is not a man to be treated lightly. His legend carries just as much, if not more, weight than the deeds of the revolutionary himself. 
Most terrifying words that he'll unleash some secret weapon or tactic from the darkest corners of Paraguay, ready to annihilate a man at any chance. While we know that this is nonsense, few in our command expect this to be an easy war. It will not be a war for grandchildren to learn about in their history books. It will not be a war made up of dashing heroes and uh, daring cavalry charges. It will be a war drenched in mystery and bloodshed. I'll struggle where every corpse is a victory for either side, a conflict, where the lines between civilians and fighters are blurred and jumbled. Atrocities will happen, and they will not be far and be few between. They will not be regrettable. They will be at the course of things going forward, for every man Gerva kills, will ten, kill ten of his. Until we banish Bolshevism from South America, none of our triple lines will ever stop. We have burnt our bridges behind us. South America is no place that will go but forwards. Crowd liberation, but let's slip the hounds of war. Nice. Oh, procedure. Submit the law. Act. The law's act is the last stage of President Law's Operation Dukan. Like the Hatch Act passed by the U.S. Congress, it forced political neutrality in the armed forces by, among other things, outlawing any military interference in governance. After this goes through, Law will finally be able to see the completion of his dream of kicking politics out of the armed forces and protecting a democracy in the Republic of Brazil, unless some darn fool manages to destroy his hard work later on. If passed. down. That's how we like to do it. Um, 37% still pretty good overall. Uh, here, huh? Maybe we lost this area just a little bit. Wow. It's a population 3 million, huh? Oh, that's not good. How would Minas Gerais do this one? Campaigning actions. And decays over time. So Minas Gerais will come back to that one. Moderately industrialized, partially, partially, partially. Sarah's doing a really good job. Poland's lost. Bye, Poland. Government victory in Haiti, huh? Paraguay Falls, another revolution quashed. Beautiful. Put these guys over here for now. That's fine. Those are eight. That's fine. Ah. Um. Back up. So we're going need you. That's nice. Not a concern right now, though. Got half political power today, which is not bad. That's really good. Questionably loyal. Oh, there we go. And then we'll do this one. Northeast is next. 
An appointment with Assis Brasil. As almost an almost rejuvenated child, I grew, in, grew into Las Vegas as he skimmed through the assembled military reports. For a chance, Brazil's military was showing an impressive capacity to progress and evolve, with new officer appointment suggestions underway. His peaceful enjoyment, however, was swiftly interrupted as he remembered the man sat before him. On the other end of the table was found Assis Brasil, who had been waiting intensely for their meeting to begin, to the point of his leg a slightly trembling in anticipation. <clears throat> Uh, though dangerous, and what some may possibly find outrageous, or shuffling the military is for the better, not doing so may leave you in a weakened position. I agree, Lot replied, closing the folders in his palm and tucking them away into his desk drawer. Through breaching the most current uh, military command structure may undermine my entire position, though I trust that you yourself will remain by my side, should anything unfavorable occur. Naturally, I would never attempt to challenge your authority. Daring to do so would be against my very principle. However, there are some who I worry may not think as much of the same. Again, Miro. Suddenly paused, shaking his hand, head left and right, and leaning forwards in a hushed voice, especially men as Costa Silva or Don Odilio Denis. Lot's brow uh, perked fiercely, a surprising fuse, leaning back into his chair. How could you say such a thing? Do you not understand that Denis is a loyal only to me, and not in a thousand years could I expect him to betray my trust? Argamiro shuffled uncomfortably in his seat, offering only a bob of his head as his struggling smile faded to express his ultimately well intended advice. He dropped back into the seat, grunting as his body connected once again with the back street. Almost trying to avoid Lot's attention, he quietly muttered his breath, We shall see. Oh boy. That's not as good as it could be, though. Critical inflation. Oh boy. Not good. Of course, that's pretty normal for us. We're Brazil. What do you expect? Senado, huh? Development elections. We're getting there. Northeast is some place we still want to work on. Uh, decisions. Ah, oh, we have enough. And then Mornis' failure. Hopefully, we can do celebrating his passing. President Lot in Brazil can rest easy now, for the Lot Act's finally passed through the Senado. Despite the military's feeble attempts to kill the Act, their meddling was not enough to stop the passage of a landmark piece of legislation. Well, that does plenty of cur to curtail the military's influence in our democratic system. Uh, there's still finishing touches that must be put in place to ensure that Brazil's democracy will never be threatened again. Namely, we must address increasing anger from the military itself and offer our assurances that we will not take additional direct action against them. Furthermore, we must also close any loopholes that are present within the Lot Act to ensure Brazil will remain a free republic forever. For now, though, we must celebrate the passage of the Act and the successful defense of our country and democracy. Hopefully. Murmurings of insurrection. Uh-oh. Law wasn't a particularly talkative person, a man pragmatic to the extreme, and that led his action to expression speak of what a thousand words uh, couldn't ensure anything unlike almost every other politician in the country. And yet, as Denny's stated a lot, his expression un utterly unreadable, he wished he was speaking something, anything really, because the silence in the room was getting into a suffocating level. Thankfully, before Denny's could say anything or to try to pry any word from that man, Law broke with the tense silence, but all but tapping the folder, Denny's brought with him. And you're saying your men are starting to talk about mutiny, yes. You're actually having the people in the headquarters anxious a lot, you can't deny it. Good, I want them to scrum in their boots. Denny's couldn't help but frown. His brow furling as he stared at the lot, adjusting his tie. Well, we've been both on been to cadet school. You need to listen to me. I know the generals can get up at you by the state of things, but this is openly antagonizing the army. We're not bloody enemies of the state. We're here to spare me the talk, Daniels. I've done my bow to the flag, too. Two, in fact. Lot emphasized, pointing to the single bevel pin on his chest, the badge of the Brazilian Republic. I'm not backing down, Daniels. They need to know their place. Daniels' eye can't help but twitch. The incredulity and the irony of the statement not being lost on him. Before he sighs, give me a simple shrug. Can't say I didn't try a lot. Very well, you're dismissed. As they saluted and left the room, the bravado and lot collapsed, a man reclining in his chair with a heavy sigh and a heavy heart. Looking at the doors from the left, he gets it. He does, but he simply cannot allow something like what could have happened. He's a military man, after all. He knows the last thing Brazil needs is more power in the army's hands. My heart and actions are utterly unclouded. Bro, that sucks. It's corrupt, huh? Let me do this one, yeah? Why not? There we go. So, we wanted the Northeast, right? Yeah, Northeast. We're going to campaign as best we can. Here. Who? Uh, plea to the saying. Now, deal with Denny's carefully caressed the brow, his brow with a grayish handkerchief. The sweat accumulated, causing his mind to fumble and his thoughts to worry. Uh, those words were in truth pure and real as he sat witness to the members of the National Defense Blog, a copy of the exact and extract, taken from a leaked version of the Lot Act. Rested before each member, they flicked through the passages or pages liberally at their own paces, of course. It's 1965. As most likely as the numbers have passed, <laughs> Denny spoke, a calm Mac hiding his, hiding his true feelings of immediate dread. The office peers were nearly comical, their faces tense and shocked in juxtaposition to the speaker, and in turn, we most likely have to unite our forces and ensure defeat. 
Though the loyalties of the men before him were already in much different places, some stood and left without a word. Others bowed in respect and rushed out, with the minority remaining behind to aid Danny's in his ventures. The madness of the act must be halted at once, good men. Being addressed, there are only reminders or remainders of the NDC bobbed their heads in assent, nodding frivolously as they listened to the words of Danny's. All diplomacy with lot has failed. All negotiations have failed. It is up now to us to try to end this madness and return Brazil to the order desperately needs. An end to the Mad King, or the trouble with the right wing? With Enrique Law proposed a plan to force the Brazilian armed forces out of the politics, Tancredo Neves, João Goulart, and Jusino Kubitschek had all pleasure to support. Though that was sufficient to sway most orthodox members of the Arguist coalition, it was decisively less of use as regarded at the UDN and its assorted conservative hanger-ons. Law tried and failed to get anything more than the basic expressions of the consideration from these people, and that was as if he was lucky. Some of them outright started spewing propagandistic talking points of the sort that would not be out of place in Costa e Silva's mouth. Others, on the other hand, said that they were sympathetic, but then started to repeat concerns that Lacerda had raised in various newspapers he owned and controlled. It was at this point that Lot realized that the Crow was likely working against him, probably because he had hoped the military might help him take power someday. A few thoughts went. Uh, through Cezu went back in defeat to the Palacio de Planalto. Perhaps if he had, if he had, had Quadros helping him out, he could have pulled the matter off, but it was of no matter. Quadros had to go, the risk of staying far away than the benefits of his, re of his remaining. He banished the thoughts from his mind and moved on. Nice. Allies in high places. The phone rang repeatedly oh, around Costa de Silva's office. A cacophony of sounds tormenting the man as he finally reached to answer whichever caller he had received. He expected a familiar voice to respond to the other end, that which he immediately recognized as the belonged to Denny's, who croaked in a hush, hush yet stern tone. Hello, Silva, began Denny's all the way out there the other end, close enough to the microphone to hear his rush breath. I have some very particular news. The madness of the Lot Act soon find itself within the Senate and to be voted on. This simply cannot occur if you understand what it means. I understand, Silva replied nearly immediately, now standing uh, firm from his seat and rushing to his office desk. You can expect my complete loyalty, Senor Denny's. I can assure you that I will join your endeavors, should they come to such. In fact, I will contact... Olympio Filho. I'm certain that he'll do much the same to aid you. Thank you, Sil Dennis Hush. His face lit up by the given enthusiasm of the receiving end. Let the military shuffle about in Brazil. Our organization will advance ensures our security should go things should things go to worse. I would say luck is on our side. Not only luck is on our side, Senor Dennis. Insurrection. Oh boy. A number of army units. Have mobilized in opposition to the hearing of the Lot Act. Elements of the Planalto Military Command have surrounded federal buildings in Goiolania and Annapolis and are threatening to attack Brasilia if the Lot Act is not immediately withdrawn. The Senado Federal has been put in lockdown, directed to reopen only when the conflict is settled. The fate of Brazil is precarious to democracy and allies with the President Law, whose response to terrified assistance of Brazil they cry for. Never cease in defense against the Republic. Our duty to the people of whom sh we should suffer. Screw that. We're not bowed down to these insurrectionists. All right, so here, well, we can do a little bit more here if we really wanted to. Still a little bit more here too. We have more support here. Denny's betrayal. Denny's made a plethora of phone calls when the time had come appropriate around that wretched day. Oh boy! At first, was the obvious launching his most anticipated coup by ordering the armed forces to march into Brasilia. All the while, those loyals in his retinue marched to maintain order in the other major cities. And Sao Paulo's men acted with little resistance, while in Rio, the city had already once sworn its fealty to Denny's with Olimpio Pilo's fealty in control. Soon enough, all of Brazil would be under Denny's, and the NTC continued to debate endlessly whether to support one or the other, blind to the gravity of the issue at hand. A lot of this dead appeared alive before retinue of sergeants and soldiers, grunts and officers alike, of which he saw only the united forces of plausible loyalists. The day has come. Um, fellow men, he began, addressing all present, the day to rally in defense of a proud nation, treacherous commanders that seem fit to declare our efforts unfit. It's up to me and you to take up arms and fight for what we know is best. Chaos for order. Let's pass this first. Military backs down. Law's not a man who praises himself, but even he can't help but give a smug grin and throw the newspaper at his table, where Navis lays on the other side. A smile is mutedly, yet beaming as his. Well, not a drinker, even he can help us share the joyous news, and a bit of morning chak uh, sal Never anybody. Especially when mixed with orange juice. I trust you've seen the news, too. Well, the talk's beneath their legs, all talk until someone puts their foot down. Well, two men celebrate the successful standoff at the barracks of Brasilia, the situation could be more different, as the officers argued and pointed at each other for possible failings. Was it the lack of strong enough bodies in the Senado? Did they come off too weak? Too strong? They certainly didn't recruit enough, and if they couldn't the fear of God on the, put the fear of the God on that dude, stubborn, Lot said. Uh, something they did wrong, and they couldn't figure it out, and so in this dichotomy, that this event is delegated to the dustbin of history, and, they're all, and they are all those of justice. Well, they got it. TV Global goes on air. Well, after after we do campaign.
Yeah, both these are higher now. Nice. A branch out of the magnet of journalism, Roberto Marino, owner of the global newspaper and global radio, the TV Globo, uh, goes on air and radio in most of the capitals nationwide. Having been granted concession on the U.S. Channel 4 back in the 1962, the Red Globo starts operations with a combination of national foreign content, such as American TV, series like Get Smart and The Twilight Zone, along with the Brazilian soap operas such as O Ebrio and O Re Dos Ciganos. Roberto Marino, a known right winger of the high prestige, brings with his channel the promise of shows that follow the global standard of quality and that can greatly outshine everything that has been seen on TV or Brazilian TVs before. The result of the first weeks of airing, however, left Global very far behind the other TV channels such as TV Excelsior, resulting in the hiring of American educator Walter Clark Bueno as an advisor to improve the reach of Global's audience. Some left wing and Vargas media outlets criticize Global for bringing elitists to an extreme and to promote right wing propaganda with their prog prog programmation. Critics that were dismissed by Global as an envy of the defeated. Buena nuete. A desperate appeal. Only a few officers and soldiers had rallied behind the cause of law. The NDC had finally deemed it fit to exit, exit its bureaucratic loopholes and deem him unconstitutional and dangerous for the integrity of Brazil. They went as far as a request for his resignation for the sake of avoiding further damage. And Nicky Law was having none of it. And his most desperate appeal. He held out and made a rush call to the American Embassy to seek a, the ambassadorship, ambassador's help. Please, Gordon Lott made his plea. It is pertinent to have the Americans help during these times of trial so that this may not spiral out of control. Gordon scratched his brow as he pondered, holding the phone close to his face in what must have been an internal silence for either man on either side. As seconds before it became minutes, he finally volunteered to break the ice and speak the truth, though he did not personally adore it. I see what I can do, and I'll contact as many as I must to ensure your survival, though I cannot promise anything either. Northeast, huh? Oh, so good at spawn support here, too. Up here, huh? Tenth of October. Oh, my support supporting here. Lot Act passes. Applause can be heard through the National Congress, but in today's Brazilian centers have passed the Lot Act. The act aimed to curtail the influence of the military in everyday politics and affairs was able to garner enough support to pass it uh, despite being bailed th attempts by the military to sabotage that act. Ever since the Estado Novo days, Brazil's military had been a disproportionate amount of influence on its politics, and candidates would find themselves more worried about the military, rather than the issues of the day and the re-election. President Lada, a military man himself, has pushed for significant reforms to the officer corps of the Army, Navy, and Air Force by installing constitutionalist allies in the place of hardliner members. The constitutionalists, as their name suggests, look to reduce the role of Brazil's military in political affairs, focusing purely on the defense of Brazil. In recent days, President Lada and the constitutionalists have slowly relegated hardliner officers to irrelevant positions, or encouraging them to take early retirement from the military. With the constitutionalist majority in the military, the hope is that they will abstain from intervening in a future political election to promote a democratic transfer of power. While some of the military are not enthusiastic about the various reforms that are in the Lock Act, there's not little they can do to change the law in the current position. A necessary step to protect the peaceful transfer of power. Zero, 74, 25, very good. Somalia. Coffee! Happy 65. Yeah, this one's really good to just do for growth. Cement legalism. Cool attentions. The surprise of no one, the military has been in vocal opposition to the law of since the day was announced. However, we cannot afford to have our armed forces continuously feel as if they are antagonized by the government, and we should work to reestablish trust and goodwill with them. Maybe a tough sell to convince the military, but it's far better that we try and convince a few folks. Talks will be set up with senior officers across the branches of the military, and a few token promises will be handed out to ensure that the military does not continue to feel as if we are targeting them. Even if we are, we're going to anger the military so soon, it's necessary for us to escalate the solution, or situation. Unless we feel compelled to attempt to cover government, it all comes tumbling down. Oh, well, it all comes coming down anyways. Oh, crap. A lot of tap his fingers sound to, uh, together lightly, and admitted terror of what might occur within the next, with most anticipation. He waited eagerly by the phone, staring at a complexity of the artifact to ease his mind of the horrors that ensued. Though they already occurred, his blank stare now tilted to the face of the window, taking but a few steps to stare down at the line below. And Piles, uh, Kupis, Kupists, stood hand by hand, surrounded at his abode, all clad in the nation's, uh, nation's uniform with a band associated with it. It all occurred extremely quickly. The situation flying by, as was properly explained, and laid down to him by some Denny's man. The officer spoke about the surrounding of Congress and now how rural Andrade, Andrade had personally stamped out a law removing Lada's president. Lada had no time to think, as he opened his lips, only to say, I resign, no man being able to gain the satisfaction of ending the presidency. 
The newly appointed interim leader of Brazil later in the evening received a phone call of his own from a very unsuspected source. Lot must be ensured a light sentence. It would be ridiculous on both their nations should he die, Denis agreed. He hung the phone, staring out of his own window into the streets of Brazilia, as the men and women of the nation eagerly waited for the next election cycle and the birth of Brazil, and end to the mad king. Well, we're done. We're dead. Okay, this guy. Duty, huh? The Ides of Brazil. At two brute were the last words of the great Caesar on that fateful day in 44 BC, betrayed by the men he trusted and thought who were his allies were going too far and abusing his power. A similar story can be told here in Brazil. Law went too far and was betrayed, but then he's plunging the dagger into Lot's back as her own Brutus. But of course, that's where the similarities end. Lot's alive and waiting to trial for his crimes and there's no civil war. However, Danes now is president and need to stave off the ongoing crest, including the prospect of elections, lest we fall into the ruin and strike like the Romans did. Well, we tried. Cycle continues. Yeah, maybe we should have kept the quadros. Oh well. Continue the election. The PTB PSD alliance, with Lot's daughter Edna as vice candidate, have been engaging in electoral campaigning against the UDN and PSB admits our coup. Let's continue the election and ensure that the wretched alliance of the PTB and the PSD does not win under any circumstance, as they will surely give us one heck of a headache to deal with if they manage to wring out a victory. I say we'll need to ensure either the UDN or PSB win, but we need to figure out which horse to back in a race. Marshal Dennis observed the crowd of protesters outside the presidential palace with a stoic expression. They shouldn't have to come to this, being forced to uh, overthrow a man who thought he was a friend. To have created a wall of military men between the palace and civilians, they didn't understand, and they were lashing out, but that was expected. And he would do all he could to answer the question they called him, but he just hoped that they would listen. Turning around to the face camera crew behind him, he gave a nod. Within seconds, they started rolling and began the most important speech of his life, citizens of Brazil. We found ourselves in no time of crisis, but we've also prevailed. In 1955, Enrique Lott and myself and other military men banded together. We did this to preserve our democracy and its constitution from the actions of President Gomez. We were successful in our nation flourished for, but Lot forgot why we acted. He forgot what men of his position were meant for. As president, he made friends with men that sought to destroy democracy. He indulged in corruption and took bribes from foreign nations, and when he realized some men would not stand for his actions, he sought to despoil our very constitution. And that's why we were forced to act, for the same reasons as we did in 55, to save our democracy. It's no empty promise, elections are coming. It'll be fair and equal, all will be welcome to participate. It's a promise not only guaranteed by Brazil, but by our constitution. Now, a farewell to you all. God bless Brazil. Broadcast ended. The camera crew, his men, and the various politicians still hanging about all congratulated him on his successful speech. They called him a hero, assured him that the Brazil was in safe hands, and they said they were looking to the elections, but none of it could shake the distant feeling of guilt in, in the back of his mind. We did the right thing, didn't we? Well, we'll see. Good, these are both top dogs. I like it. Because right now we're here with uh, Denny's military rule, huh? 15%? Oh, that's possible. 8%? Not as much. Ooh. Two, oh, 18, 18, 18. That's very heavily divided. We're looking good there now. Ooh. Hmm. Bahia. What do we do Bahia next? Bahia. Back the bull. United the UDN. Kill the bill. Develop economics. Stuff the ballots. Popularity of the candidate falls. What if we didn't do this one? And they still won no matter what. PTB is only 14%. That'd be interesting. I have 18 seats there. Because you could do back the bull. Mr. Aruba Masfaz is our sure candidate. Adam Mars is exactly the right man for the job of affably corrupt, as we can easily bribe him to do our true bidding as president, and he already has links to us. Truly match made in heaven. The only thing we needed to watch out for the Varguis hiding amongst the PBSP's ranks, but well, that should be dealt with in time. Cash and corruption, huh? Kill the bill. Simply put, the lot acts is nothing less than a travesty. Places too much burdens on the military and removes the role as protectors of the God given nation as earned people by constraining our much needed power. It's therefore important that we turn the people of Brazil against him. We must use Lacerda, TV Global, and the news and everything else in our power in order to shift the tides against this bill and ensure something like it is never submitted again. Let's envelope economics. Adamir is a uh, little thing he likes to call the envelope system. That is to say, bribing undecided to turn up all elections and vote for you. A little green motivation often inside envelopes. We should use the system extensively to get people out to vote for Adamar and to secure a landslide victory for him and the PSP. 
and stuff the ballot boxes. For the revolution in 1930, landowners would bribe some men into stuffing some ballot boxes to boost the chances of the preferred candidate. Now it's time to bring back such a necessary evil by ordering our officers to do the same thing. Some may look down on us for doing such a thing, but they will understand the need to prevent the country from falling into the wrong hands again. We could, but we'll see what happens. Victory for the laborists. To celebrate his victory, Jao Goulart decided on a traditional churrasco in his old gaucho way. Ooh, churrasco, ooh. Supporters and allies like Vargas and Kubishak came to congratulate him and even had to proclaim a speech or two drunk as he was. It was a day for celebration, after all. Even when all guests had left and everyone in their house slept, Goulart and Leonel Brizola remained by the fire. The brothers-in-law ate, drank, and they left, and toasted each other in the slurred words. This was a moment for praising and rejoicing, and Brizola said. The next few years would be an uphill struggle against the forces that corrupted Brazilian politics and oppressed Brazilian workers. Brazil President João Goulart would lead the labor movement to new heights. Brizola said in a final toast, and the free people of Brazil would see a future of happiness, far away from the next president's home. Four generals sat in a smoky back room. A somber atmosphere between them. How can this happen? How can they allow a socialist, a puppet of Vargas, a gosh darn communist governor of the country? No, this wouldn't do. Now is the time for action. That's where Getulio Vargas smoked a fat Cuban cigar in his dark office with an almost gleeful grin. No. How the generals must be seething right now, he thought. As the smoke filled the room, Vargas remembered his days in power and how hard he fought for the nation. Now Django would have to fight his mentor's battles, and with some assistance, his success would be almost certain. A night of applause and insults. So, do we actually get another book sheet? No, we still have the same one. Same old one. An unacceptable outcome. Then he's read the newspaper with a blank expression. Jean Goulart and the PTP victorious! He already knew that, of course. He had watched the induction carefully during the previous evening. It left him numb, and the feelings had yet to subside as he read through the article without truly taking it all in, his mind elsewhere. How could this happen? Were the, were the people so foolish and so naive? Had everything the country been through, they thought to not only run off back to the Varguist, but the red band of idiots founded by the dictator himself? Had everything he had done been for nothing? A top old man, a friend, and did it offend the Constitution just so another could tear it apart the nation's social order? As Gay turned back towards the photo well, plastered on the front page, where Goulart and his cronies celebrated the victory, the grins wide and arrogant, Denny slammed the paper onto the tanning table, ignoring the mess made of his meal and the cod from his force of his blow, his face etched in fury. No, this is not the end. If the Marxist dude thought he could ruin everything, Denny's and his men had struggled to defend and serve, then he would surely be disappointed. The people had made a mistake, and in such circumstances, it was up to the men like himself to correct the populace and prevent them from self harm. Straying away from the table, he made for his phone. He and his men saved Brazil before, and they do so again. The Brazilian cast has yet to conclude. Ooh! Marxism will not prevail. Washington on side. Operation Mosquito. So I guess we do have to do these? Interesting. So when you get cooed, you have to do it. Back the bull. I guess we can do that one. Cash corruption. Uh, what the heck happened to our gosh darn country? A cripple, crap brain pinko has managed to weasel his way into the highest office of the land of all the effing places in Brazil. And now this little stupid idiot wants to implement his dumb ideas of his dear idol Marx. Goulart's spells will destroy Brazil just as they destroy the USSR. We cannot simply stand here and allow that. The one rule is that prevent Brazil from falling due to the failures of communism. Then we need to unite the military against this common threat. The military has been disunited for quite a while now, but now it's time to get our bearings together and stop Goulart from taking power. Even it means we have to detain our own, who have clearly been misguided by him. Uh, we'll see what this is like. What could be the direction that we follow? Was it right or wrong to remove the lot? Should we have a public election or push through with a junta? These are among the many questions that have uh, proven divisive in the past few months and has consequently caused great disunity within the military. But now, more than ever, it's critical that we find unity and cohesion among ourselves regardless of what we believe that should have been done. Marxists are at the gates of Brazil's highest office, and it's highly important that United is one to take the stand against the red tide lest Brazil be swept away forever. The hunt for an heir. Adamer said deflated in his office. He had thought that the third time would be the charm, but the presidency had evaded his grasp once again. What age would he be in the late 1970? Late 60s, he would be 74 by the end of that term if he won the election. No, Adamer thought there would be no fourth running, no fourth blitz across Brazil, no more shaking hands and kissing babies. The presidency, which had been so close yet so far away, had evaded his grasp once and for all. The presidency of Adamer and also would be consigned to the work of fiction writers discussing what could have been. Adamar stood up to go outside and thank everyone for their hard work and good contribution to the campaign, and that was not the end. But then a small thought emerged in the back of his head, one of those whose thoughts that start out small, but then rapidly grow and grow and grow until it was all you th can think about. What if this was not the end? Despite his age, he could still easily play an influential role in Brazilian politics. He was a political grandee, and had played a crucial role in Brazilian politics for the last decade, despite never having been a senator or reached the presidency. He just needed an heir, an heir to his ideals and the PSB, an heir that would, other, uh, would outlast even him when the, one day he died. But who could it be, Adamar thought? The answer was obvious. The man who had endorsed for the government, governor of Sao Paulo, the man who had personally appointed as his replacement, and won a landslide election as governor for the state. Adamar paused for a moment. Him, really? The rich playboy of philanthropist, former, son of a former president. Would this man truly be capable of continuing where Adamar left off? Well, with, the, uh, with his guidance, he could. Adamar broke into his smirk and exited his office, quickly thanking and passing by those who come to see him before he reached his secretary. Get Vargas Jr. in the line now. We have much to discuss. Combating the octopus. So no matter what, you have to go that route, the, this route. So 
So what about the people? Like, cause they elected these people. Did they just take it lying down? Cause oh yeah, election date. Yeah, there's that. It's already past that day though. Uh, Danny's brow flooded profusely. The marks of his forehead sculpting with little accumulating sweat resting on his top. Brazil's heat could be unbearable, and even after a lifetime in the country, the temperature hadn't settled just right for the old general. His thoughts were rudely interrupted by a plethora of uh, officers and militants gathered on the table, chief among them Costa e Silva. They both tallied. Oh, yes, under the matter at hand. Then he's announced, his train of thought finally colliding with the realities. Jingo Goulart's political shenanigans are becoming too much of a nuisance. His campaign must fall, and there thereafter, someone else must take his place. A contender, I might say. And he announced, the conversation mark maker. Uh, the rest of the men spending a little time in silence as the room broke into conversation. Danny slipped on, slipped on his water, observing intently. Silva, instead of joining in on the cacophony, he simply shook his head. He went to right as if disappointed. It is too late for this, he interrupted. The table suddenly falling under the usual awkward break of silence. We have bet everything on the election we, that we ran. And if we were to overturn Goulart's result and instead insult Lacerda, well, it would be rather unpleasant. Raising on his voice, head gazing from his left onto his right, carefully taking into account all faces sitting surrounded at the table, not only in an electoral sense, but living in senators and governors whose only alignment is with their own agenda, it really does allow our hypocrisy to shine through. Come on, you all understand, called forth Dennis, nearly on the edge of his own seat. It is what is right. For the sake of integrity and democracy, and though he appealed on around the room, nearly going from person to person, he found himself with more opposition than expected. Most of the generals that mattered had made up their minds on both sides, stood on his, on, stood on, stood on easy ground. Shock Denise broke back down into his chair, uh, looking into the retinue of men who had just been indirectly spitting spitting in his face. It was outplayed, he knew, and even with his general cold headed nature, he couldn't stop himself from muttering underneath his breath, barely so that the only audible sound from an outside perspective would be a sigh or a puff of air. Merda. Apprehend Aragio. Admiral Candido da Costa Aragao, leader of our venerable Marine Corps, is an unfortunate loyalist to lots on the left yet, has currently avoided our ire for insolence. The neutrality during Lotz's position allowed us to turn a blind eye to his problematic police activities. But now with Gullert set to take office, he becomes a much larger threat than we anticipated. It's just critical that we apprehend him before he has the opportunity to assist Gullert in his rev uh, revolution, planning to do an Asa Usui. Asa Su. A smooth boss to know of how Gullert like a blanket on a cold night. He floated through the restaurant floor, unintrusive, unintrusive, but with presence. Warm lights and wafing aromas of European platters coax the patrons in relaxation and Gullert into the thought. There's plenty to do an Asa Sul, yet he wanted only to come here again and again. Gullar rested his arms on the table, brewed broad of his food. He chose a wonderful place to meet, Edna. Edna Lott, tapping a foot to the music, gave a full beaming smile. She cut into her steak and spoke from beneath her brow. I did, and now you always choose it too. Ah, this is your plan to make me, uh, place me in your death then, huh? With well, the president for a father, I suppose it'd be a waste if you didn't learn some of his tricks. It's not all right, he's more blunt, probably learned it from me. Gullar laughed, a moment passed, and the purpose of his meeting rushed into his mind again. Edna, I'd like to get your opinion on current censorship laws. Respectfully, Xiao, art number article 233 of the Civil Code says that the private property of married women is completely controlled by the husband. It is urgent to half the population. When the husband's assent is required for them to obtain a job so that they may afford property in the first place, then my opinion is that on that is clear. Yours must be too. Golar had reservations. Such drastic change would not come easily, but the right to work, the right to own, was far more important. Tapping at the wine glass, he smiled. Well, it does change the code. So I really wonder what happens. Are we going to have a military coup or not? The worst is yet to come, and that was officially connected to the highway, gentlemen. Cheers! The small group of politicians, engineers, and foremen down the drinks in a one swift motion, celebrating yet another stretch of the Trans Amazonian Highway's completion. Getting through. A uh, large swath of the Amazon these past months have been particularly difficult. Unfortunately, the worst was yet to come. Living in the back of every one of the revelers' minds was the grim understanding that these last sections of the highway were going to be difficult. Though they'd already breached the Amazon, the next step would be to take already exhausted workers and failing equipment into the deepest, darkest parts of the greatest jungle on Earth. The politicians, snazzy and clean suits and judicial in their drinking, were dreading it the most. It was their job to sell the last stages of the project to a populace that had been expecting it done years ago. Uh, <coughs> the engineers and foremen were more optimistic. Looking at it on a map, this was all half to them. They already kept their way through half the blast of rainforest, so what was the last stretch for them? The workers had been set loose on the city for a week, and as the expedition repaired and readied itself for the upcoming months. Celebrations filled the streets as hundreds of men drank their worries away, spent their accumulated paychecks, and enjoyed the company of Manaus' finest performers. They're going to enjoy the rough spy for as long as they're able to, trying to ignore the choking jungle all around them. The Amazon wastes. Oh, we've located the maximum. 11%. Jesus Christ. Establish SNI. While we've managed to successfully pull off the coup, there's hidden traitors in fifth columns hiding among the rakes. 
Biding their time for the perfect opportunity to strike back at us and bring Brazil to its knees. Simply be too consuming for us to dedicate the time and resources and rooting these weeds out. For, therefore, we establish a centralized organization dedicated to hunting these traitors, the Servicio Nacional de Informaciones, or SNI. The SNI will be a secret police force dedicated to weeding out disloyalty from the ranks while the military deals with more pressing concerns. Oh. Okay. Nice. Washington outside. One of our biggest problems is ensuring the support of the United States. Well, this has always been supportive of our actions in Latin America in order to counter the Argentinians and their stifled or pervasive influence. Individual presidents may be opposed to what we're doing. Luckily, however, the American ambassador is on our side and is thus critical to that brief and inform of our plans so they may handle Washington for us. Plan of action. Civil domination is it? And now the military needs to be pulled out of politics completely. We just can't leave a, vapor, a viper in a cage. We have to take out its teeth. Leandro Brizola's florid face press, uh, presaged a million assaults. And yet his gaze fixed on Goulart's was calm. His quarrelsome nature was cooled by his brother-in-law, but Goulart's calm could not preclude him from voicing his loathing of the armed forces. The two were united in the hatred and the intrusiveness of the military were more than an obstruction. It was an antathema to their dreams. Visions of violence flashed through Goulart's mind. The weight of tanks cracking the concrete of Exio Monumento. Bullet-ridden doors propped up by the piled bodies of the presidential guard and emaciated Brazil suffused with blood only ever rousing to hemorrhage. He would not allow it. I completely agree, but we can't do this immediately. They frighten quickly and they shoot even quicker. If there's such so much as a single snag along the way, we'll both be killed. I need you for this, Leonel, but I need you to keep silent by the armed forces until I say otherwise. Brazil gave a grin. They retreated into a solemn nod. He said nothing, but nothing more needed to be said. On the table was on her side, it kept from Brazil's hand by an inch of Jabota's wood. Resisted a minuscule back black microphone. And from an underground bunker three miles away, two officers listened and scowled deeply. A snake with a teeth can self constrict. Operation Mosquito. With the Galat's inauguration fast approaching, there's no doubt that he has his own plans. It is therefore critical that we unveil and execute our own plan, presented to us by the Heartlander Generals, Operation Mosquito. When Goulart and his goons arrive in Brasilia, we shall rest in triumph before our tribunal for collaborating with foreign powers. In the meantime, we shall send troops to occupy the provinces of Goiás and Rio Grande do Sul in order to paralyze the snakes he calls his allies. Then, as the dust settles, we'll temporarily impose martial law and order to calm the nation and stabilize the situation. From there, General Denis can step in or step down in favor of General Costa e Silva as the next president appointed by Congress. Brazil shall prosper and shall fall. Never into the barbarous and desperate hands of Marxism. One lot to another. It was a pleasant day, Brasilia. Enrique Taquera's, uh, Taquera lot was pleasant that he was able to use his good day to meet with someone with neither opponent. Oh. Uh, I, I've read this before. Thank you, Dad. Well, okay. When does is, when is it get inaugurated, then? Um. Uh... His PSD did really well. The PTB did okay. I'm not entirely sure. Watching outside. Two men sat on the car, sharing each other's companies. They were practically had no other choice to do so. They knew each other's names, it's true. However, they were unsure they even come to be, uh, had names to begin with. Regardless, they interacted. And with comments of curiosity between one another, ensure the boredom wouldn't overwhelm them. Both men were in the active stakeout mission of what seemed to be an SS spy ring cell headquarters. There was little activity, thus the first of the two men spoke to the other. You hear about Washington's orders? The second man looked over again to his right, shrugging in ignorance as the silence was broken again. I must have missed the memo, he said, he remarked, semi-sarcastically, letting out a chuckle before digging his teeth into a good chicken sandwich. We'll be able to stabilize the regime after the coup in January once Django Goulart's out of the picture, replied the first man, tapping his fingers under the car's wheels to replicate a small tune. The other agents swallowed turbulently, looking back at his side. Really? Aren't we the... Aren't the PSD good allies with Washington? And by proxy, the PTP as well, I suppose? Django's linked to those independent minded politicians. Some of them are on a Japanese payroll. As if we need any more of the influence on our continent. The first man muttered, leaning back into his chair with an audible grunt of fatigue. I can't believe Django would do this, the second man replied. Shaking his head in disappointment while taking another bite out of the sandwich. Oh well, for the greater good. It's what must be done. Tale of two presidents, Gular, with his leg shaking, crossed the stairway and opened the heavy wooden door. The time to his plane's departure steadily ticked down in his mind, but his inauguration would not be complete without a chat with two of the men emphatically clasping his hand. Gildulio Vargas beckoned him to a pair of red other chairs which were quickly occupied. Gildulio, how have you been? I've been looking forward. You've been looking good in your uh, old age. I, I am president like uh, Genguino. My existence is unpleasantly ironic. My seat in the Academia de Letras is named after Manix off for conspiracy. As the Volmo was never proven, and I'm afforded protection by wealthy Portuguese speaking men. If you are ever offered a seat by the Academy, don't take it. It'll ruin your presidency. No, I remember they call you immortals. A reception like that isn't appropriate for me anyway, but for you it's very different. A reception I don't exactly get to leave Sao Paulo very often, but it's true that I left a shadow over this country. From what you've promised, yours will be cast even longer, and it, it ought to be in this if this farago of failing administrations is ever to be corrected. 
I'm not going to be any more important than anyone who's come before me. I'll be a good president, but that's my, the job anyway. Brazil needs a good president. Indeed, now more than ever. Now get to Brasilia, Mr. President-elect. A sword is put to rest. Oh, boy. What a great stupid day, Saint General. Figueiredo arriving in his office. Matilda, I cannot believe that I'm going to become a general. Figueiredo's secretary kept tapping his promotion speech, making him slam his hand on the table. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Congratulations, General, she said. You showed them, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so those mother efforts who support that piece of crap mummy now lost the ground. Denny's won't be missed. Uh, Figueiredo sat on his chair and lit a cigar. That stupid old idiot was driving us against a big brother, and with him gone, I can now take over. Matilda would continue to have a speech, though there, she was cautious to prevent another outburst of anger. Figueiredo was not a man to be challenged. The news of Odilio Denny's retirement had been music to his ears, as Denny had always been neutral on America. Figueiredo could hardly wait to give a smug smile at a ceremony what a long week this wait was going to be. Those years in America taught me a lot, Matilda. I think that despite being bo uh, born in the scrap, well, I am a true American, right? The time spent in the school of the Americas has turned me into a true general, but not the disgrace we have in Brazil right now. Matilda was finishing the speech and didn't reply in time. Figueiredo slammed his hand on the table once again. But let's see what happens. Because we're halfway through January, and we should have the election soon, right? Right? Or is it so, so still going to get cooed, no matter what? So, I'm, as you can see, I'm definitely preventing from doing anything here. Uh, that would not allow Zhao to become president. I step down. 14%. 20%. Oh, boy. Communism, huh? Fascism, huh? So, maybe we're forced to have Denny's no matter what. Hey, yeah, we're 8% down, which is pretty good. Elections. Yeah, there's nothing here. Presidente. Senado. Mm. Well, maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe we have to go down this way. Which does kind of suck, I'll be honest. And, oh, so... Um, but I guess, hey, we'll see. I already read Operation Mosquito, but we'll see. Alright, everyone, so... No matter what happens, uh, we're gonna get cooed. So, Operation Mosquito! Well, Daniel Denny's tapped under his chin lightly, somewhat phased from the talk occurring before and around him. He paid much attention, not allowing himself to be completely disconnected from the matter at hand, but not actively participating in the pointless murmurs and whispers trailing around the table. Though he knew. He had to launch himself into it. Uh, oh. A Mexican chatter stood men like Costa e Silva, General Cruz, and the Frota, and some Air Force officers he could barely recognize, apart from Bernier. Scanning the different faces among the room, he finally lifted his voice, while well, Goulart, one of the two choices, the room fell dead silent. All men moving their heads to meet Denny's gaze at the head of the table. He'll be allowed to either flee the country, he gave a short pause, tasting some of the <clears throat> meeting standard mineral water at his disposal, or capture him alive on his arrival to Brasilia, where he plans to drive the PTB to his side. No one voiced any opposition, only bobbing and nodding heads, technical speech, and operational inquiries occupied the room as officers schemed and planned while under the guidance of Denny's watchful eye. As the scheming was done and the day came to rest, Denny's uttered one last sentence before taking his leave. We'll speak when we are done. So. Yeah, unfortunately we can't do much, so I had to leave the Army and Navy. Bravery and Valor. Uh, Brazola launched himself almost forward to grasp under Jingo's arm. You'll be captured, of course, killed, he muttered, giving a true attempt to stop his friend from running straight on into the lion's jaw. Jingo, however, only shook his head reassuringly, switching the back from his left hand to his right hand, so he could give Brazola a pat on the back. I must leave for Brasilia. To fight for the presidency, to fight for freedom and democracy, I cannot, if I cannot do it, then what can we expect from Brazil? Goulart queried, giving another repeated back to his comrade. In response, Brazola pressed his hand onto his face anxiously. You always prepare against a fight in Rio Grande do Sul, Jingo. When the coup comes, it'll be most safe. I must go no matter the cost, he interrupted, taking his bag with both hands. If I am arrested, though, I will need my family taken care of, and Edna, safely transported to Uruguay, our fate rests in her hands, should I be unable to. The brothers-in-law uh, embraced each other then, and final goodbye as a speaker called for all passengers aboard the planes. A south would be unguarded by Jingo now, Gulat knew, and with all his force, he could only muster one last prayer. Safe travels, Jingo! Safe, safe travels. Now we get to the focus, but there's no point doing them. As we will see very soon, Red Sun, like him as smells to cheese. Then he snickered to himself, his, his lonely abode inhabited only by fellow military personnel or caffeine addicted politicians arriving early before our work hours. Soon, Jean Gugulot would rest easily into his palm with SNI and some of his armed forces men awaiting his arrival at the airport to finally capture him. Though then he had little time to celebrate. A young army, as a young army officer, stormed into his room unannounced, patting and puffing air, allowing little time for the general to ask his purpose. Uh, as he held up an envelope, you must read this, Senor Denny's. The envelope was practically thrown on the desk, and before he could scold the officer in decent behavior, his jaw dropped his eyes skimmed through the contents of the letter. He could barely believe his eyes, standing to give the words another reading, yet another repeatedly, as his head collided with his head in a desperate attempt to comprehend. Dead, and the wreckage of his plane crash, how can this be? Sitter Denny's. His eyes fixated so on the document, he barely noticed the presence of Costa Silva. Senor Denny's Silva muttered, finally speaking up, I've seen what's happened. Then he sparked his brows, furrowed brows into Silva, an increasing ache of rage making him almost untumble and tumble back to drop onto his desk. Do you have anything to do with this, Silva? Denny's asked, remaining respectful through adorned with a stern tone. How would you know this quick? Hmm? Is there something I must know? Though Silva was known as a conniving man of little honesty, 
It was most likely in the moment for the first time in his life he meant something in the most truth. I have no knowledge of this unfortunate uh, event, Senor Denise. I do not know. Out of my office, I need to think. Breaking the glass ceiling. Oh, Edna becomes leader of the Progressive Party. Oh. Probably still getting better, though. Uh, still does inauguration. Things was nearly a few me in the mouth, controlling himself from a tantrum as he still processed Jingo's death. It was not discussed. He was to be kept alive, arrested when he arrived at the airport, not shot down by out of the sky by some fighter jets to level him into the ground and ensure his death, sure. It could put an end to some immediate issues, but it made everything worse in the long run. Last night, I had fled to Uruguay, giving some crippling speeches about Brazil's government, and then dematerialized Cuba to do whatever it may be. The USA loses confidence rapidly in an impressive show of cold feet, and resistance to the government becomes increasingly more apparent to proportions larger than expected. Costa de Silva gave his grandiose inauguration feast, surely one to remember, if only Denny's had been paying enough attention instead. He was wondering his own thoughts. Which pilot could have done this to shoot it down? Most likely the Air Force covering up their tracks to protect one of their own, being prone to hide the truth when in times such as these. That would need to be an issue for Silva to resolve. Silva stood down from the dies and walked to shake the hand of a plethora of military officials, politicians, and legislators, all celebrating the jubilation of a new president. Silva said nothing when grasping onto Denny's hand, shaking it intently, while a smile of content rested upon his face that moment Denny's couldn't hold it in any longer. He was too old for politics. He had served well, very well, and deserved some now time rest alone. Rest alone, and in peace until death came to take its price. He wanted to retire to a beach, yes, perhaps not too far from Rio, close enough to hot beaches covered in yellow sand, but far enough from tourist wooden cities which bother the scenery you enjoy. An epoch comes to an end. Wow. Look at this guy. Brazilian president elect killed in an air crash. President elect Goulart's administration is in flames already as the plane he was crashed. He was on crash on its way to Brazil for his inauguration, despite popular support. Goulart faced stiff resistance from the Denny's government, which came to power after the overthrow of President Law. Prior to his ill-fated departure, Goulart met with his brother-in-law, Governor Leonel Brizola of Rio, de Z uh, Rio Grande do Sul, who now states that Goulart's plan had been, in fact, shut down by the Denny's government. Although the Denny's himself has stepped down in favor of a military presidency under General Arthur da Costa e Silva, which the Congress has quickly confirmed. Only a few congressmen, especially from the UDN, have been allowed to take their posts. Brazil takes a dark turn, and one can only hope that something can steer it back to the light. How could this happen? Which sounds like... Uh... I think that should be the end. But, um... That... This would... Oh my gosh. That's a big flag stop. Um, crocodiles. Uh, that, uh... Ended up in a civil war eventually. Her father was right. Politics are just like a pool full of crocodiles with sharp teeth waiting to feed on innocent men who simply wanted change seen in a, the home they loved. She was determined to ensure that the lives of those innocent men were not lost in vain, but first she had to step onto the stage. Edna gave her best attempt to shield her anger, though her face still showed blushes of rage that gave a red that gave away her blood melting rage. The American journalist had asked her for a few questions, most of which were about her life and career, though one risky pretender approached with a very peculiar inquiry. What do you make of the situation in Brazil? the reporter asked, with a pen and notebook at the ready. Edna had to give some time to think in, though the answer still came flowing out with little forethought, as a machine gun with live ammo. The death of Django Goulart is possibly the worst thing to happen in Brazil. Murdered by his dictatorial oppressors, his legacy is left in shambles and his work unfinished. Though I remain, and with myth me the opportunity of a future for Brazil. As his vice president, it is pertinent for me to introduce the fact that the current government is completely illegitimate and no rightful president resides in office. Oh boy. The questioner reigned after the comment, with increasing interest from the journalists who simply could uh, not have enough. It mattered a little of those who questioned her for being a woman. It was time to rid Brazil for the political crocodiles. Uh, Parrying for democracy one step, uh, one small step at a time. A laugh in exile, huh? A long march. It took an hour's driving and then an hour's marching for Jao Amazonas to reach his destination. Flies and insects buzzed all around him. It was almost constantly raining. The politicians were corrupt and there was little, no, to no, little to no infrastructure. In other words, it would be a perfect starting place for a revolution. No one asked any question about what Amazonas was building here. The thick forest canopy meant they were protected from aircraft. He could get used to the fl flies. He stood back and watched a number of his comrades get to work, lifting and transporting boxes, cleaning their weaponry, and ensuring tents were set up. It took them weeks of traveling and searching to pinpoint this very location, but when they had found it, they realized it was perfect. Too long it had been in the cities, arguably pointlessly with a revisionist of minor policy and dealing with schisms of the communist movement, due to blind faith in the past leaders' methods. How could these fools not see that the past leaders of the movement had all failed because they were not committed enough? That they had compromised too much? Prestes. They are a revisionist traitor. That was the biggest disappointment of them all. They had been fooled by the social fascism of Vargas and the PTB, despite fighting against Vargas in the 1935 revolution. That accursed revolution whose consequences saw his wife Olga be deported to Germany and caused her to face almost a certain death in the slave mines. Amazonas spat on the floor thinking about this. Once he believed in Prestes, but there was an old saying, never meet your heroes, and Amazonas certainly regretted meeting him. Amazonas went back to thinking about the eventual aims of this camp. He planned for a revolution that started on the countryside that would support the peasantry, and quickly spread to those cities. Of course, the revolution would not be built overnight. They needed more arms, more money, more personnel, more everything, really, but he and his comrades were committed. Revolutions had succeeded in the past, despite hard consequences, or circumstances. And Brazil would succeed as well. No longer would Brazil be oppressed. No, Brazil would be truly, truly free. 
Araguaia will be at Petrograd. And unfortunately, that is the end of Brazil's content, which I don't know some of you are probably disappointed that we, we went with the wrong route. We should have gotten uh, quad, kept Quadros in, which could have prevented everything else from happening, but we're here where we're at. So, I don't know. I wanted to play Brazil again just because to see whether anything was different, and we've been cooed. So, um, I don't know. This might have happened last time, too. But uh, we still have a lot of act. Go figure. So, I don't know. At least we passed it. That's his last final legacy. But if you enjoyed the video and the campaign, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. And have a great, great rest of your day.